Today's episode has been brought to you by Schedulicity. And also by the Pelvic Health Professionals membership site. To find out more, visit pelvichealthprofessionals.com. Welcome to episode 133 of the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Crow, a mother of three, a yoga teacher, and a trainer and consultant working for yoga teachers. This podcast was created for you, dear yoga teacher, because I wanted to create this place where you could connect to information and inspiration every single week and feel supported as you navigate not only being a yoga teacher and all that goes along with that, but also being an entrepreneur because you are a business owner. Today, we're continuing the discussion of pelvic health and pelvic floor. If you haven't already checked out the previous episodes on this topic, I highly recommend that you do so. In episode 121, I shared my own experiences and how that impacted how I teach yoga now and why I really niche down to share yoga for pelvic health. Then, just back on episode 129, MJ Forget gave us an in-depth look at the anatomy, form, and function of the pelvic floor. I've heard from so many of you that you are loving this episode, that you learn so much about your own pelvic floor, and that it's really informing your own yoga practice. If you are interested in diving in more to learn about your own pelvic health or to empower your students with this information and the movements and the breath practices, Visit Pelvic Health Professionals, the website, and look under the resources tab. You can see all of the articles, podcasts that we're gathering. And also, if you're listening in real time, you still have time to join us in the membership. So doors close September the 13th. It is a Friday. I believe that 13 is a lucky number, even if it lands on a Friday. So don't let it be unlucky for you. If you would like to join us, make sure to get in there and sign up. We would love to have you. Today's episode is all about how the health of your pelvic floor and how that's related to sexual dysfunction or painful sex. And I really do dislike the word sexual dysfunction, this term that we often hear in the pelvic health world. And I really want to share a shout out of thanks to Dominique, who wrote an amazing article on this in where she really called out instead of calling it sexual dysfunction or pelvic health dysfunction or pelvic floor dysfunction, let's start calling it pelvic floor condition or pelvic health condition. So in this one, we can think of this as a sexual condition or painful sex. Painful sex is a topic that many of us might find uncomfortable to talk about. It's not something that we might bring up at a party But there are a lot of us, particularly women, who struggle with painful sex or sexual conditions. Dr. Casey Denenhauer is an expert in this area, and she has combined her training as a pelvic floor specialist and yogi to create a unique and holistic approach to healing. Casey explains more about the pelvic floor, its role in sexual function and dysfunction, and how she integrates therapeutic yoga physical therapy, and meditation to bring balance, nourishment, and empowerment to her patients. We also discuss how we as yoga teachers can responsibly talk about and cue the pelvic floor. All of our show notes are ready for you at theconnectedyogateacher.com slash 133. There you can find the links, there's clickable timestamps, so you can easily go back and check in with a specific topic or look for a link that we talk about. Thank you so much, Katie Dolan, for your comment on our website. Katie said, Hi, Shannon. There is so much to learn from your podcast. At the beginning of each episode, I have my notebook and pen ready for a new day of learning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. That excites me. That's the type of learner that I am, although sometimes I'm listening to podcasts while I'm out in the garden or walking or driving and I can't take notes. So it means a lot to me that you are taking notes and learning from the podcast and that it is supporting you. Thank you for taking the time to write that. Connected Yoga Teachers, have you left us a review yet? That is really the best gift that you can give a podcaster. It's like a way to say thank you and a great way to have a moment of fame because I like to call you out and read one each and every week on the podcast. Before we meet Casey, let's hear our hot tip of the week from the amazing team over at Schedulicity.
Hey Connected Yoga Teachers, this is Scotty with the Schedulisty Hot Tip of the Week. Class Client Alerts can help make sure nothing goes overlooked, whether it's unresolved billing, unsigned waivers, or other missing information that can easily be forgotten in the hustle and bustle of a busy class. If you have multiple yoga teachers working at your studio, this is a perfect way to make sure everyone is up to date and on the same page. Your online client files will stay more organized than any filing cabinet, giving you a greater peace of mind and more control over your time and space. And in case you don't know what Schedulicity is, they are ultimately the best scheduling software for any yoga teacher who lives in North America. I have been using Schedulicity since 2011, and I just can't believe what they're offering at their company. Right now, they're rolling out a new payment system, not for us Canadians, but for people in the U.S., which is amazing. It's an amazing savings for small business owners. And they are also doing amazing work with hashtag Schedulicity Cares. So make sure you look into that. There's a way to enter to win $5,000. That's right. Schedulicity is giving $5,000 every single month to a business owner who uses their platform. Yep. The company is literally that amazing. Okay, let's dig in. Dr. Casey Denenhauer is a pelvic floor physical therapist, as I said. She's also a registered yoga teacher and the founder of Enlightened Physical Therapy, which is focused on providing conscious care for pelvic health. Casey graduated as a doctor of physical therapy in 2010 from the University of Illinois at Chicago and has continued her education in the areas of pelvic floor, orthopedics, and therapeutic yoga. I need to suggest right here, go follow Casey on Instagram if you are on Instagram. I love her stories with her partner and how she shares how she has suffered for years from pelvic floor dysfunction and pelvic pain herself. And this is often what leads us down this path of pelvic health when we discover, oh wow, this works for me. I want to share this with other people. So since then, Casey has integrated yoga, breathing, meditation into her physical therapy in this really cool East meets West approach. The really cool thing if you want to reach out to Casey after listening to this today is that she offers one-on-one and group care and also does this over Skype or in person. So if you can't travel to her, you might be able to meet with her online. Let's dive in and meet Casey. Welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast, Casey. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Shannon. I'm super excited that we get to talk about how yoga can be beneficial for people who are dealing with pelvic pain. But before we get there, I want to find out like what brought you to this work. Tell us about the work that you do and how did you get there? Because I know you're a yoga teacher and a PT. Yeah. And I became those things kind of at the same time. So I graduated PT school and I got my yoga certification in the same year back in 2010. And originally my yoga practice was really just something to keep me healthy and exercising and mobile while I was dealing with the stressors of physical therapy school. Um, And then within a really kind of chaotic, um, crazy orthopedic PT environment, which I worked my first three years of my career in. And in some ways, that part of my life was really fun. I was seeing 25 patients a week or a day and didn't even know any better that, um, you know, being completely exhausted and burnt out and energy depleted at the end of the day wasn't normal or or even necessary, but, you know, I was a new grad and my way of dealing with that was going to pretty hot, sweaty vinyasa yoga classes, um, and teaching a couple classes on the side throughout my week. And then over time, my own kind of adrenal fatigue really started kicking in as well as some old injuries that I'd had from gymnastics that were just seeming to be aggravated actually by a vinyasa yoga practice. So I started finding more and more of the spiritual aspects of yoga to be uh, appealing and resonate with me, as well as the more gentle practices like hatha and restorative and yin. 
And around that same time, I started treating more and more uh, pelvic floor and pelvic health patients. And it was a few years of that kind of dipping my toe in until I really got immersed fully in working with the pelvic pelvic pain world, really. Um, and by that time, I was developing in my own body, in my own practice, like a really safe, quiet, mellow yoga practice. And that included the asana and the breath work and the meditation um, as well as the self inquiry and self study. And I was honestly getting a little bit not frustrated in my physical therapy practice. I was working for someone else at the time. And um, I was noticing that I was helping people with manual therapy. We were doing a lot of manual therapy. Um, but in doing so, I. I was depleting myself for sure. I was having, you know, doing pretty intensive hands-on work patient after patient for like nine hours a day. Um, and also I was helping people, but not getting them quite all the way to a place where they were feeling really good. Um, it would be like, we'd make progress and they would feel better to some degree, but then there was this missing link and, what I started seeing um, was really actually, I don't know if you or your viewers are familiar with Jessica Drummond. Um, yeah, I've heard of Jessica, but feel free to yeah. expand on who Jessica is. She runs the Integrative Women's Health Institute and she teaches a functional nutrition and health coaching program. And her program really started me on a journey of looking inside and, and, in my own life, seeing where I can slow down, what in my life is making me feel good and supporting my nervous system and my adrenal system and what's not. And so I started taking this course and immediately saw that it was directly applicable to my patients. And so I started teaching physical yoga postures without really calling it yoga to my patients with pelvic pain who who were terrified of moving. And some of these people would go to a yoga class. Some of these people were terrified of even, you know, sitting for an hour or um, doing any kind of movement. And so I just started developing based on what felt good in my body, what a, a little program, like ways to talk about very, very common postures, but with a very specific cueing to the pelvic floor and to the breath to influence um, basically down training or a relaxation response of the pelvic floor and the fascia and the muscles around the abdomen and the diaphragm and the pelvic girdle and the legs, um, basically in order to help support me as I was treating them to kind of make my job a little bit easier because I found that that people were reporting decreased pain response or pain scores within a session, whether we spent an hour doing manual therapy or 45 minutes doing more movement and breath-based interventions. And so I do think there's great value in manual therapy and I wanted to continue to do that. However, I think it's greatly supported by the more mind body um, exercises and and just uh, practices in general that yoga offers us. Um, so I started doing that more and more and more, and people, for the most part, are really receptive. They feel like it's something they can take home with them. And um, the cool thing is that there's there's endless ways of modifying postures. There's a million different ways we can prescribe a breath work, uh, but most of it honestly is just giving the patient permission to move in ways and give attention to their body and specifically their pelvic spaces um, when maybe they've never even heard that as a possibility. Right. Oh, this is amazing. I just want to come back to where I'm, I just think it's 
unbelievable that you were seeing 25 people a day, even just to like speak to 25 people a day. Seems like that would be a lot. I know. Now I'm pretty much maxed out at six. Um, Right. Yeah. It was, and definitely, you know, had AIDS and it was a totally different patient population. So it's not really totally, you know, can't really compare apples to oranges, but yes, I've become more and more sensitive as a human and a practitioner over the years. And I just don't think I could ever go back to that model. Right. That's fascinating. Thank Mm -hmm. you so much for sharing that story. I love how you were seeing how, you know, your, your education as a, as a physical therapist, as you call it in the U S physio therapist, we call it here in Canada. And it's just easier if I say PT, (laughs) um, as a PT, and then also all of the work that you did as a yoga teacher and how they really combine to inform what you share now. You also are very open about sharing your own. Um, and I, I, I would love your take on this because I feel like I read somewhere in your about page, pelvic dysfunction or something along that line. I always hesitate to say that. I yeah. feel like it It sounds like something's seriously wrong with someone. That's a very good point. Yeah, I think sometimes we get caught up in the lingo of what's easiest to document with yeah, <laughs> um, or prove that you need insurance coverage or something like that. But I completely agree. I, I was a person with pelvic floor, you know, issues, things that came up. I don't even know what, what, how you'd want to reframe that. But um, yes, I agree. Our language around this is really important. Mm -hmm. And so then when did that come in? Did that come in before you became a PT and a yoga teacher or after where you started to deal with your own pelvic health? I mean, I had, so I was a gymnast and I had pretty bad low back pain from the time I was like 13 and I have a little bit of scoliosis. So that was something that was just present throughout my te- childhood, teenage years, really. Um, and also looking back and knowing what I know now, I also dealt with a little bit of stress incontinence as a gymnast as well. Um, I always thought like it was maybe just discharge in my leotard, but I remember being very uncomfortable with wearing just a leotard. I would always want to wear shorts and a leotard. Um, but I definitely never talked to anyone about that at that time. Um, and then I started having intercourse when I was 16 with my boyfriend and I remember there being some discomfort, but my pain with sex started to worsen in college. And I saw many doctors. I mean, I had repeated UTIs and yeast infections in college and, um, I was also on the pill for probably, I think probably 16 to 26. And, you know, I went to all these doctors and basically everyone told me to drink more wine and use more lube. (laughs) Right. right. That's really common for people to hear that from the medical community. Unfortunately, it is the story that is, yeah, I hear it every week almost um, in the clinic. And so as try as I might with that approach, <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> um, and probably just made my yeast infections worse, to be honest. Right. And um, yeah, and then things shifted and changed depending on partners. And I just really couldn't put my finger on what was going on, but I knew what the doctors were telling me or it wasn't helping at all. And then in physical therapy school, I started, um, we did a little project for a woman who has a private physical therapy clinic in Chicago named Judy Florendo. And through that project, we learned who she was seeing and why. And she was seeing every day men and women for pelvic floor stuff. And she, you know, incontinence, pelvic pain, Um, a lot of bike and running related pelvic pain in Chicago. Um, And it was really interesting to me. And it also really resonated with on a personal level, like, oh, this is a group of muscles at the base of our body that 
can be connected to the musculoskeletal system. And of course, like given the history of my kind of beating my, my body up as a gymnast, like that's probably a thing that's happening in my body. So on a personal level, I was interested. And then professionally, I was really, really moved by how powerful pelvic floor PT can be in helping people with really basic quality of life level issues that we take for granted until something goes wrong. Right. Um, And then on top of that, I've always been kind of the person that people can go to and talk to about. I mean, my high school friends would everyone talked to me about their period and sex and that sort of thing. And so growing up, it was a joke that I would be a sex therapist, but I just <laughs> always felt very comfortable talking about the, the things that are taboo in our culture. And so the, this role as a pelvic PT, where I kind of get to, I mean, I really do like, that's part of my main mission is to kind of destigmatize all of this stuff and, and take out the shame because I believe that 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 these like societal beliefs and longstanding um, attitudes and and um, not even you know not conscious necessarily thought patterns about our bodies and this area of our body have a, a really heavy influence on on when things go wrong. Right. Well, you were saying that you you experienced some stress incontinence when you were a young gymnast and you weren't telling anyone like you knew then just from being raised in, as you said, the society that we're raised in usually where people aren't as comfortable talking about public issues, then Mm -hmm. you just didn't tell anyone, which, you know, at that point, if you would have been, if that was available for you, it could have made a big difference. I like what you said that as a pelvic floor PT, you can make a big impact, you know, in many ways, one-on-one for sure, planting the seeds one-on-one, but also, you know, like through what exactly what you're doing and what I do in my workshops and retreats is empowering groups. And then women talk, you know, and men talk too, but women talk a little bit more about this kind of stuff. And that's what really moves me is, you know, the, the people, the sisters and the moms who hear about this stuff secondhand and then are interested because, I mean, that kind of word of mouth, it carries a much, um, I think, more intense weight to people on a personal level versus just like me sitting here lecturing someone about the pelvic floor. (laughs) Right. So Um, when you, oh, sorry. That's okay. So yeah, so that was kind of my pain with sex journey and and I I got treatment and definitely some of the musculoskeletal approaches and the manual therapy really helped. But what also helped was starting um psychotherapy and getting therapy like support from a therapist because I was really dating the wrong person. I was sleeping with the wrong people and so this was at the same time that I was deepening my yoga practice and kind of looking into my behaviors a little bit more consciously. And I found this, this concurrent thread line of the mind and the nervous system influencing my body and what would happen after sex and vice versa. And that's not to say that the pain was in my head or that it was this kind of, um, out there response, but the patterns became very, very clear um, that something in my nervous system was regulating how my body was responding. And then that, that started screaming at me much more loudly and clearly when my stress levels rose um, and a long-term relationship I was having. And I started having urinary incontinence, like out of nowhere, seemingly. And I was uh, probably 24-ish and just completely losing control of my bladder associated with an urge. So for me, the urge was having to do with water and like taking a shower. And I saw very quickly what I was preaching to my patients or teaching my patients, which is that the bladder really functions on this, this 
pattern of loops um, and neural signals and, and that very easily we get stuck in these patterns and, and my body learned that it was okay to have an urge <laughs> and to pee my pants basically. And um, then I went back to, to pelvic floor PT and that was kind of like a new level of my understanding and, and really planting the seeds for thinking that I want to share this with more, more people and um, start doing the more intensive training that it takes to become a pelvic floor PT. And that was about three years after I graduated uh, physical therapy school. Oh, wow. That's amazing. I I really appreciate that you're sharing with our listeners the, the personal aspects of that story and that you're talking about it, you know, openly on your website, with people on Instagram. I just think it's very powerful it, just getting the information out there alone, not only the, like us, also on top of the work that you're doing. Yeah, you know, I, I found that if I, and I've gone back and forth about this because obviously it's very vulnerable and scary <laughs> to yeah. share all this information um, and whether or not I feel like it's, you know, quote unquote professional for me to do so. But in the end, I get the response that you just shared with me and I get people opening up and and feeling like they're allowed to tell their story too. And that I feel like is the most healing aspect is just being able to voice what we're experiencing in our body. It's therapeutic for me. It's therapeutic for the people who I'm connecting with. And yeah, you never know who me telling a silly story about me peeing my pants is going to resonate with and give them a little bit more permission to maybe go to a doctor or see a pelvic floor PT. Exactly. That's amazing. So I want to clarify because you had said that you had, you were noticing that you had painful sex. And what is the term for painful sex for our listeners? Um, dyspareunia. In my case, it was not necessarily, I mean, we can, vaginismus would be difficulty with insertion um, or penetration of any kind. Um, but I use dyspareunia in my physical therapy practice. You use that instead of vaginismus, that term? Uh, not necessarily instead of. It's usually in conjunction with. Vaginismus could limit insertion or penetration at all. Um, but dyspareunia is more of a general term that describes pain with sex that could come from many different reasons. So then can you tell us the different symptoms of both of those? Do you feel like those are the two definitions that you would say, okay, it's this or it's this, or it's a combination of both, or are we missing any other? Um, I mean, there are many other things we could talk about too, like vulvodynia and vestibulodynia and pudendal nerve issues. Um, There's a lot of reasons why someone might be experiencing dyspareunia. So dyspareunia is this general term that just means pain with intercourse. Um, and the underlying causes of that, I think are, I mean, a much, much longer conversation. Um, but typically the, that the definition for vaginismus, it, it involves an involuntary spasm of the muscles of the pen around the vagina that would limit or cause pain with penetration. Um, So basically it can be painful or impossible for a finger, tampon, penis, anything that you want to put into the vagina. And there are definitely varying levels of that, but it's, it's vaginismus refers to basically the tightness of the muscle. Right. And I just want to clarify for our listeners, this whole idea of like have a glass of wine and this whole idea doesn't change it, doesn't change the physiology. It's not, that's not the answer. And what I'm hearing you say is that you went to psychotherapy, you were doing yoga and you were also doing PT. Was there anything else that was sort of part of your, your own self-care, your own self-treatment in this and, and reaching out to a team? Um, at that time, no. At this point, um, I 
I have different kind of, of hip and pelvic pain, but still pelvic floor related and um, much more hormonal based. So if I could go back, I would definitely look at the hormones and um, probably come off the pill sooner and get back in touch with how I'm eating. And that kind of more of a whole, like a whole system approach to dealing with with urinary dysfunction and pelvic floor dysfunction or however you want to term it. (laughs) And who would you reach out to, to be part of that team? Um, I'm a huge fan of anyone in the functional medicine world, really. So people that are looking at root causes. Um, So naturopaths, functional nutritionists are amazing Um, I really like working with people in the yoga therapy world because we're, they're aware of, of the multiple different systems, the, not only the physical body, but the emotional body, the energetic body, um, acupuncturists are a great support. So that's a big part of a great advantage of living in Los Angeles is that there are so many healers and, and providers Um, that my patients already often have when they come to me. So creating this mind-body team is really nice. Um, And obviously, sometimes you need the more Western medicine um, physicians in that team as well. I'm not discounting the power of that by any means. Um, But I find that, that physicians or other providers who are looking at root cause are really who I would go to see myself at this point and who I kind of steer my patients to go see. Right. That's a great list. So naturopathic doctors, functional, what did you call them? Nutritionists. So we would specify Uh, um, like functional medicine nutritionists. Is that what we call them? um, There's a term called just functional nutrition. Okay. Yeah. And then PTs, and it would be a bonus if they specialize in pelvic health, I'm guessing. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and then acupuncture. That's a fantastic list. I'd love to ask you for our yoga teachers out there, if someone came to our class and they said, I am I have my team already, or I'm working on getting this team of, of these other people, or let's back it up even, I would say, if someone came to me as a yoga student and they told me I am experiencing painful intercourse, I would make sure to then refer them on to a pelvic floor PT. That's a first kind of step in my process anyway. I feel like that really opens the doors for people. But then if they're working with that team, what can we as yoga teachers do, say, if we're working one-on-one with that student or if they're in our group class? Do you have ideas around what what is helpful? Yeah, definitely. So I think, I think on just the, the basic level, the more, the more questions and the more understanding and interest you have in, in not diagnosing obviously as a yoga teacher, but just trying to understand, um, what is happening for that specific person. And, you might not know the questions to ask even at the beginning if all of this is new to you, but there's a million different reasons someone might be having pain with intercourse. You know, is it, um, is it insertional pain? Is it deep pain? Is it with oral sex? Is it with orgasm? Is it after orgasm? Can you even orgasm? You know, there's all these questions that as a pelvic floor PT, or even a sexual medicine physician is hopefully asking, right? So as a yoga therapist or as a yoga teacher, you're not necessarily um, doing asking all those questions to diagnose, but it, if you are aware of the wide variety of, of what might be happening, you might be better informed about things to ask for or just um, just to better understand where your client is coming from or where your student is coming from. And then, so interest. And and if you are really working one-on-one, especially with this person, I think it would be very beneficial to log on to podcasts like yourself or um, listen. I mean, there's, there's a lot of information if you start going down this pelvic floor, pelvic health 
um, <laughs> yeah. path out on the internet. And some of it is really, really good. And some of it's just not so good. But um, educating yourself is would be amazing. And then in terms of your approach as a yoga teacher, I, I always go back to the brain and the nervous system is influencing all of the tissues in our body. Um, so as a PT, my modality is often doing a, what I call like a bottom up approach. I'm using my hands often, or um, sometimes uh, like a tool on someone's skin or fascia to influence how the muscles, fascia, and the nerves are on kind of this, the body level, right? But and so sometimes, sure, we could we could break up some fascia, we could break up some t- scar tissue. That happens, but th- the greater effect with those manual therapy practices are that it's allowing those tissues to start sending a new signal back up to the brain, which then influences not only kind of feedbacks back into those muscles or those that fascia, but also feeds back into Um, someone's experience of pain. And so that's, that's kind of what I view as like a bottom up approach. I'm trying to create changes in the tissue or create changes in the nervous system from a sensory level to influence someone's experience. And then um, yoga lends itself really well to influencing the system from the top down meaning how we control our breath, where we place our attention, what our thoughts and uh, patterns of beliefs are. So it's kind of, uh, and we can do something as simple as the breath, just choosing, using your brain to zoom in and pay attention to the breath has an effect on the parasympathetic nervous system, allowing the body to come into a rest and digest state which then allows the entire system to quiet down. And the cool thing, I mean, with with some of the mindfulness research that's coming out recently is they're finding pain levels decrease with mindfulness, which I think is not, I mean, it's amazing that they've found this in studies, but I don't think it's such a far stretch to believe. Right. Um, Yoga but teachers not, might know that really well, but yeah. time and science says, yeah, yeah, it's actually true. Yeah. But not only do they find that pain intensity decreases, so like on a scale of zero to 10, for example, but people's um, pain suffering, so the, the bothersomeness aspects of pain decrease, I believe, even more than the levels of intensity. And so I view that as, as a very top down approach and yoga is a cool modality because we the two are meeting and that's exactly what I explained to my patients is that my job is to really support you in in our treatment sessions when you're here with me one-on-one from kind of a bottom up but also to lay the groundwork for you um, because you can do these top down things at home on your own um And if you can partner that with a really therapeutic, great, restorative posture, the better it is. Like, great. (laughs) Right. Oh, I love that you bring this in because I think sometimes, and I felt maybe it's because I'm super aware of myself in this. The more I got into studying pelvic health, then a lot of the times I was thinking, oh, do I need to become a pelvic floor PT? And do I need to do more, be more? And you're bringing it in that there's a real place for yoga teachers in this as one of the pieces, like as one of the modalities that can really help someone. Yeah, I completely, yes, I agree with myself. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I I, uh, would love to hear if you can think of some really specific yoga things that you use with people who are having, experiencing, particularly painful sex or vaginismus or pain deep in the pelvis. You know, we also see this with, we did an episode, two episodes on endometriosis and also one on interstitial cystitis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, 
I want to add one more thing to the advice for yoga teachers and, and I can, can easily transition into that. And that would just be to, once you make a referral or if someone already has their team, call their pelvic floor PT, like email them or call them and ask them what is going on. Because if someone, there's a big difference if someone's pelvic floor is really tight, hypertonic holding tension and, and causing issues, or if there's laxity and um, weakness, and that's going to really change. You could do the same yoga postures. You could do cat cow in a way that allows for facilitation of opening and relaxation or core strengthening, right? Um, How you're using your words and your maybe a gentle placement of your hand to cue your student or your patient. So call the provider and actually get more details on what's happening. Um, That is a great point to add. And I kind of jotted these down just to summarize. Very first is like the interest in that person and asking, asking a lot of questions, not to diagnose, but to understand. Uh, I had the next one as education and this, I like how you said, like, be careful of the information that you are taking in. Like there is some information out there that's not really up to date or correct, but overall, if we look for what PTs are doing, I think we're, we could, we could follow your stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) And then the approach, this top down approach. And then this, I love this, this, um, not only referring to someone who specializes in pelvic health, as a PT, but also having a conversation with that person. And so we would ask for permission, I'm guessing, from our yoga student. Absolutely. Yeah. And then this is something that happens at at the physio office that I work at because we have an integrated team. Like there's massage therapy, there's yoga, there's our PTs. Like we have all... You have an ND there. It's such a nice way to really help someone with different modalities. That's very special to have a a group like that all in one place. (laughs) It is. But if we didn't have that, you're saying it's okay to reach out to. I think sometimes yoga teachers are afraid to do that. I love it. I love talking to trainers and yoga teachers because they're usually able to see my patients more often than I am just because of um, financial limitations, you know, people like to come in to see me once a week and then supplement with other, you know, other practitioners throughout the week. So, yeah. Okay. That's good to know that, that it's really helpful for that yoga student and that, and, and that there isn't this barrier. If yoga, yoga teachers are feeling like, well, are they going to think I'm trying to take their clients or, replace them. There's, Mm -hmm. there's not that there's this collaboration. Yep. So you talked specifically about, about cat cow and how you could use the same pose in two different ways. Would you break that down for us? Yeah, sure. So if I'm working with someone who will make a very broad generalization and assume that someone with pelvic pain, or let's just say vaginismus, that contraction of the pelvic floor muscles Um, is having hypertonic, meaning the muscles don't want to turn off. They're kind of stuck in a contracted state. I want to use my words and the positions that I'm helping a person to get into to facilitate an opening and a softening of the pelvic floor. Um, Thinking of creating more space between the sitting bones at the base of the body and between the pubic bone and the tailbone to create some laxity. Um, And the image I often use is like a rose. And so a a tight kind of lifted pelvic floor would be like a vagina would the pelvic floor is kind of like a bud. Um, So the perineum is pulled up and into the body and then a neutral position or a relaxed and open position is like a rose that's kind of like in mid bloom um, where the flowers are all open and, and soft and relaxed. And then 
um, the full range of motion would actually also include like a full bloom of that rose where there's a lengthening and a, and kind of like a, a pushing out of the anus and the perineum and the vagina. So knowing that there's a full range of motion of these muscles at the base of our body is really important. And all of us, no matter which end of pelvic um, pain or weakness, or we could talk about all those different diagnoses, but everyone should be able to move through this full range of motion in their pelvic floors. So in a, in a pose like cat cow, and I want to facilitate opening and softening because the person's having trouble doing that. And I wouldn't know that if I didn't actually do an internal evaluation. So that's where it gets useful to talk to your providers. Um, I would say from your hands and knees, I want you to inhale, tilt your pelvis forward, send the breath into the base of your body. Think about creating space between your sitting bones and softening at your perineum. And <clears throat> then for, uh, for cat pose in the opposite way, because I don't want to maybe facilitate a strengthening or a closing for this specific patient, I'm not going to cue, pull your belly button up and in, can tuck your pelvis underneath you. Instead, I might switch attention to the shoulder blades and I'll say, now push your hands into the mat and dome your heart up towards the ceiling. So I'm saying inhale, open, soften, broaden at the base of your body, and then exhale, create space behind the heart. Right. That oh, would that's be great. <laughs> I feel example. like that makes so, so much sense. I love the visual of the rose. Yeah. And, and I have, you know, come up with all sorts of visuals you can because that rose analogy resonates with some people and some people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> right. So there's all sorts of ways that you can talk about that, but I like those specific cues like pelvis to heart mm-hmm. because I have found in my practice of doing this, that really the access point to healing within the pelvis is the heart. It's the connection. It's what we just talked about of me sharing my story. It's mom's hearing about all this stuff from their daughters, it's friends talking about it with friends. And so that is the heart connection and the love, the love and attention and kindness and gratitude that we can foster within ourself towards our bodies, uh, specifically towards our womb space, our pelvises, our vaginas. Honestly, I am learning more and more and more that this is the ticket and yoga is such a beautiful way to facilitate that connection. And and these teachings come a lot from my work with my teacher, Uma Din Smartuli, who wrote the book Yoni Shakti. Oh, this is a beautiful book. I'll make sure that we link to it in the show notes. Yeah. And I've had the pleasure of um, being on and assisting a couple of her trainings this year, which she calls well woman yoga trainings. And um so in terms of the specifics of what I've been doing, I've been teaching a lot from her um, work, which honestly, a lot of it is really just the, the core of it is connecting heart to womb. And you can do that with your attention. You can do that with your breath. You can do that with emotion like cat-cow. You can do that in Tadasana. Um, but yeah. I'm, I'm going back to basics. <laughs> that's amazing. So that's for a student who might come to us and a pelvic floor PT has said to them, you know, your, your pelvic floor muscle, those, it's just holding a lot of tone or it's really, those muscles are not releasing in the norm. I don't want to say normal, but they're not, um, they're holding a lot of tension. There we go. <laughs> and so what, What about for the yoga student that comes and says, you know what, my pelvic floor PT says that I need to be working on the strength of my pelvic floor? Okay. So we could use the same pose. Um, And with cat cow, what I would then cue instead is to come into cow pose, drop your pelvis forward, notice what it feels like across your sitting bones. 
and your perineum, that space between your vagina and anus. Use your inhale to draw attention there. And then on your exhale, as you come into cat pose, think about drawing your vagina and your perineum up into your body, closing the space between your sitting bones, your pubic bone and your tailbone, and maybe allowing the low belly to just hug the center of your core as you round your spine. So that would be focusing more on the strengthening, the core um, activation component of things. Same pose, just different, different words. Right. Is there anything else that you would like yoga teachers to know if they have students who are coming to them and saying, like, I have some sort of pain in the pelvis or painful intercourse? I guess the biggest thing is don't assume. And I guess we already talked about that a little bit in terms of asking questions. What we haven't talked about yet, I guess that this is the place to do it, is is someone pre or postnatal? Um, is someone experiencing, uh, did they have a pregnancy loss, which is still technically postnatal? Did they recently have an abortion? Is that, that's technically postnatal. And with that, all sorts of hormonal shifts can happen. And I would venture to say that someone, I mean, I treat women in their fifties who had babies in their twenties as if they're postnatal sometimes because they never got the postnatal care. But I think that that just awareness. You don't have to ask someone if they had recently had an abortion or a pregnancy loss, but it's important to consider that this is going to be a major factor in, in another source of influencing how people are experiencing pain with intercourse. Right. It's so true. There are so many things and you must see this all the time there's so much that people can do once they share it with someone and someone other than like, I want to just say hats off to the medical community in that they do amazing things in surgery and medication and they're doing their job on, on that side of things, but they're just not trained usually in pelvic health. So do you want to speak to like some of the difference that you see happening with people when they come to work with you? Like maybe they've experienced years of a condition and then. Yeah, I think, yes. So I just like to give people awareness to and, and permission to be in their body and aware of what is happening in their body and to take away some of the fear. Because if someone's been experiencing chronic pain, Um, a lot of what's influencing their experience is fear. And so there might've been an inciting event. Um, Oftentimes there is that kind of sparks pain, not always. Um, But certainly anyone with pain over time doesn't like feeling like they're in pain. And so just the response to being in pain is often this guarding and holding and gripping and bracing away from the pain, regardless of why the pain started. And I have found that giving people permission to draw awareness to that response is very powerful. And also just validating that and hearing them that I believe you, I see your experience Oftentimes people leave the appointment saying they feel safe, um, saying that they feel nurtured. And I don't think it necessarily has to do with anything that I'm doing on a physical level. I think it's more just like I'm, I'm allowing for that person to be in their body in a different way. And all sorts of different providers can provide our patients with that experience, including yoga teachers. It's actually a really good platform to do so. And then I'll go into things like, you know, this is actually great for yoga teachers to be aware of too. Another thing on that list would be like where someone is on their cycle and getting someone on cycle tracking. If, if they're still bleeding or in that Um, more fertile time of their life, but even being aware of the moons and things like that post menopause can be really nice. And it it allows for an interaction with your physiology that feels like it gives you some power. And then you can start 
start choosing, oh, I'm on this part of my cycle. I can do this list of exercises today because this feels really nourishing or, you know, today I'm bleeding. So I'm actually going to give myself a little bit of a break and just do like a yoga nidra or restorative practice. Um, So that has been another thing recently that I've shifted more and more to. And that's, I'm also doing in my own life and patients have really resonated with that. That's amazing. There's a lot of talk. I was listening to a podcast. I'll try and find it if I can about our cycles as women, how we cycle and the difference that men cycle differently and how it affects us as business owners. I thought it was yeah. fascinating. Yeah. There's, there's a couple cool people that are talking about that. Um, Nicole Jardim is the uh, really good period researcher, uh, research, um, sorry, resource. She's a great resource. And um, the Elisa Vitti of the Woman Code book has been my recent go-to. Okay. I'll put those in the show notes. That's fantastic. This has been so amazing. Uh, I know that you have all kinds of offerings. You have retreats, you have online offerings. People can meet you in person. If our yoga teacher listeners want to connect with you further, how can they do that? I am most active on Instagram. So you can follow me at EnlightenPT. It's E-N-L-I-G-H-T-E-N-P-T. So that is where I post most frequently. I do an Instagram TV series with my partner where we talk about all sorts of fun pelvic floor and PT related things um, in a way to kind of destigmatize partners being able to talk about this stuff, um, which has been really fun. So you can follow me there. And then um, I also, my website is Casey, C-A-S-I-E-D-P-T dot com and I post uh, details about there's all sorts of stuff about my previous retreats which is called retreat to your root um, I don't have another one coming up until April 2020 but I am accepting applications for that if people want to join me for one on one and then I do workshops around LA but also travel I'm going to St Louis in a couple of weeks to do a workshop at a yoga studio there so most likely to just um, catch me with the posts I I make on Instagram in terms of my schedule, which is (laughs) (laughs) ever-changing. That's amazing. Thank you so much for your time today and sharing your story and all of this really valuable information. It's been great to talk with you. Thank you for having me, Shannon, and just for providing this resource for people. It's really important. Thank you again so much, Casey. I learned a lot. I am sure that our Connected Yoga teachers did. Thank you so much for your time. Alrighty, Connected Yoga teachers, I want to hear from you. What is your key takeaway? What did you learn in today's episode that you might take into your own yoga practice or into your classes? How do you feel now? I always feel like when I learn about my anatomy, my body, I feel a little more empowered with information and this just inner awareness. I would love to hear from you either in the show notes or in our Facebook group. If you are not already a member of our Facebook group, come on over and connect with us. Go to the connectedyogateacher.com and look for the join button on our homepage. A couple of announcements before I sign off. Connected Yoga Teachers, if you want to work one-on-one with me, I have spots open in September at this point as I'm recording. Also, there's an amazing group coaching with Amanda McKinney and I where we focus in on helping you to book more one-on-one students. All of the dates and details are on the connectedyogateacher.com under work with me. Also, as I said before, the doors close on pelvic health professionals September the 13th. So if you are thinking that you would like to sign up and learn more about pelvic health and how you can use it in your own practice and how you can share this with your yoga students, join us over there, pelvichealthprofessionals.com. Thank you so much to our Connected Yoga Teacher team. And thank you also, dear listener, for taking the time to tune in today and to learn a little bit. And I am just excited to see how you're going to share this out into the world. 
Before I sign off, I want to know what will you be doing this week to stay connected to yourself, to your yoga practice, and to your community so that you can share the yoga that lights you up. 